Hi everyone, welcome to our 55th video session. Today we have Sarah DeBoer Yort, who is going to be hosting the video session for today. And we're really excited to hear about her work in the nonprofit space in particular. But before we get started with that, um, I'm gonna introduce what we do at video sessions really quickly, and then we'll get right on to the presentation. So I'm Shivani Choksi, and I'm the CEO of Impaction. Our mission is to expand the talent pool in the social impact space. So we bring people into the social impact space through events, and then connect them to real jobs in social impact afterwards. Um, the purpose of these video sessions is just so, just to get that weekly inspiration with people in our network, and essentially, um, just learn from entrepreneurs and innovators around the world. So like I said, we're really excited to have Sarah here today. Um, but before we get started with that, I would love um, for people to introduce themselves. So um, I'm going to go first. I'm Shivani, like I said, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, my other job is as a budget analyst at Chicago Public Schools. So I'm very much involved in the education and um, the social enterprise type of scene in Chicago. Um, Christopher, are you able to introduce yourself? Um, I am Christopher. I am from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I am just starting an education nonprofit. So I'm literally willing to learn anything right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about your nonprofit? Um, well, I volunteered in Cambodia for a year, so I want to support education there, but I also want to do something locally. So um, we will be doing school supplies drives, um, and I, I want to get teenagers uh, involved with volunteer and community service. We need more people like you. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to introduce, um, I think actually Sarah already has a question for you. Do you have your 501c3 yet? No, I do not. All right. I think Sarah might have some expertise in that field. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Awesome. So Sarah, I'm going to introduce you and we will, and if you want to add anything to that introduction, go for it and we'll start with the presentation. Awesome. So today we're learning about building a sustainable nonprofit by changing lives through computer science education from Sarah. She's a social impact leader and the founder of Necessities for Children, a nonprofit whose mission is to provide academic achievement and advancement um, and job readiness skills to support low-income youth. Sarah is a skilled and dedicated leader with experience working for corporate companies in Canada and the U.S. Currently, Necessities for Children serves over 100 children in Florida, which is in the USA for people who are watching our call, um, through collaboration with existing youth service providers to provide hands-on STEM and computer science programs with the goal of reaching 1,000 children by the end of this year. So Sarah, really excited to have you here today. Do you wanna share any more information about yourself and then get started with the presentation? Um, well, I think I'll get started with the presentation because I think that just shows the journey and my story and um, and how how and why I'm where we where we are today and why even you you and I connected. So, anyways, if I can, I'll just do a screen share and go right into the presentation. Right there. So my name is Sarah. I am uh, the letters behind my name and I answer master advertising special. Uh, that is a certification within the promotional marketing industry, and that is the industry that I was uh, in for 20 years before I got into nonprofit. So, in fact, I have a two-year college diploma and not even a four-year bachelor degree. So, as we go into this, I will talk about some of the things that, um, you know, uh, getting into. Let's... Uh, my screen share moving next I'm actually a Canadian I'm one of uh, six kids a very large family I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in southern Ontario and uh, I'm with an identical twin I've actually got twin brothers which are at the back and a brother and a sister in between so when I was 10 years old uh, I started milking cows and my dad's six six so the deal was is when we were as tall as a cow that's when we started milking cows so that 
that was, um, <laughs> we started, I, I was 10 years old when I hit as tall as a cow and started milking cows. And it was certainly what gave me the work ethic to where I am today because when I was in college, I uh, did forest firefighting and loved being outdoors and all everything that that entailed that had to be my best job ever, if you will. Uh, however, um, due to hip surgeries and, and medical challenges, I had, I landed myself into a doctor telling me that, you know, if I wanted to walk when I was 40, I had to change my physically active lifestyle. And I didn't know what I wanted to go to school in. Um, being one of six kids, um, my parents didn't have the funds to pay for secondary education, if you will, for all of us. And it was kind of like we had to pay for it ourselves. And I worked part-time jobs and wanted to come out with the least um, amount of school debt. And, um, and at the same point, believed that anything I could do, I could make happen. So I fell into sales and by accident, the job that I applied for, when I had applied for it, uh, I found out who I was up against and I got this job and, you know, it's a long story, but uh, I, it said, you know, three years, uh, it, they wanted a bachelor's degree, five years sales experience, like this and that and the other thing. And my boss at the time had said, don't worry about that. Just read the job requirements. She goes, you can do it. You can do it. And I go, well, okay. <laughs> so I'm reading the job requirements and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I can learn that. I can do that. And so long and short, I got the job and my boss, uh, you know, three months in, I said, why did I get the job? You know, I just have to ask you and he goes um, one word he says passion so um, passion has led me from the beginning and um, you'll see that was actually in Kenya in 2011 or actually that was in 2016 I was there on a 10-week teaching internship this year I was the president of SAC uh, which is Specialty Advertising Association of California which is uh, the third largest trade association in the United States in promotional products industry so um, uh, where that all led me <laughs> is to when I'm in the corporate world and, um, you know, I did this little video of, uh, of you know, my elevator speech and a mentor in my early 20s had said to me, you know, if the world was your oyster, what would you do? And my answer was, if the world was my oyster, I'd make a difference in the lives of children. And it didn't really gel until, you know, through the corporate world, I climbed that ladder and did that for 20 years and really gained some essential skills that in 2011, I went over to Kenya on a mission trip. Uh, it was a medical team. However, I ended up kind of running the flow of the clinic for a week and we saw about a thousand patients and that was with uh, the Molly Children's family and a church group out of uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, so anyways, that gave me from there, I came back and I just knew I couldn't go to the, you know, go back to things uh, as I knew it. And from there, I was getting my the 501c3 and trying to figure out a way how I could make that happen. And it was actually the 501c3 was approved when I was in Kenya. Um, I wanted to go back, but I didn't want to go back under a, under a group, if you will. So I found out a way I figured out a way to apply and um, and was approved as a director intern at the organization in Kenya so I went back for 10 weeks in early 2016 uh, as a teacher and uh, so um, and I gained the certification needed to teach English as a second language and taught English composition uh, for 10 weeks in uh, in about three hours outside of Nairobi and it was in early January 2016 when I was over in Kenya that the 501c3 approval came through and uh, but by 2000 by getting back from that it was like I had I put a lot of my own funds into making this happen which <laughs> as most founders will you know say that you 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 see that you don't have support and you don't have a way to say you know get support other than crowdfunding if you will or family and friends and network um, so it's difficult and uh, so I had to go back to the real world in a paying job until 2018 when I was able to again leave and seek professional um, 
And when I say professional, I say scholarships in the nonprofit world. So we'll get into some of that, uh, but really honing in on um, finding the gap and figuring out that there's a lot of nonprofits. And one of them, you know, again, people cross our paths for their reasons. But as I was um, becoming involved in children's services in Broward County in Florida, where we were at the time, I was uh, really, again, seeking where is the gap and doing business model canvases. And in fact, with um, uh, FAU, which was, we had some real notable accomplishments this year, and they all came came as a result of, again, uh, scholarships that I was able to achieve uh, to gain leadership capacity in the nonprofit world, as well as um, seek opportunities to network in the community. And by that, I mean going to Children's Services of Broward County, and it was actually at one of those quarterly meetings that I met the president of the Fort Lauderdale Museum of Discovery and Science. And that from there led to um, being put in touch with someone else, which we ended up doing a fee for service and a collaborative agreement to reach 250 kids last, last year. And that was, so it's been those kind of collaborative agreements that I've, I've sought and um, continue to seek. And even with the Tech for Kids, which has been, you know, I talk about filling the gap and finding the gap. So we had thought it was initially, our mission statement was written really broad. So we had to, um, my mentor, when I got down to Florida said, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, it doesn't mean you can't do, every, do other things. He says, but you have to be known for something. So we had kind of thought it was literacy, but I wasn't really getting the grant approvals or we weren't. And um, uh, this year, towards the end of last year, I was really like, it's computer science and um, knowing funding out the computer science education was, computer science it was only introduced as a uh, subject in the curriculum in the US, uh, high school and elementary, middle school, public school, only eight years ago. So in 2012, so when you think about that and the number of jobs that are in the tech field and the computer science really if that was only introduced 12 years or eight years ago how long does it take to actually one get all the teachers up to speed and get it actually implemented when a lot of the um so i'll get into one of the accomplishments was our fau um uh FAU Tech Runway, we had applied into a competition, which is an incubator program, and through that we were able to do a study, and um, the study was based on the educational landscape in the U.S. Um, so that really helped there. Um, I'm just trying to think what was the third. Oh, the other thing is, is that um, really in our work started in Kenya, but our board of directors has asked from the, had asked from the beginning that we really focus efforts on becoming established in the US. So, and, and our, in fact, our narrative and our mission statement to the IRS stated that exactly. It said our, although our work will start in Kenya, will be expanding to the US and other parts globally as we're able. And so we were very blessed with an amazing, amazing, or I was connected with somebody who's awesome in the nonprofit um, area and her name is Dr. Kitty Beckford. And um, she's out of, she lives in Missouri and um, I'm happy to share and connect anyone who needs her support. But uh, she is somebody that is a nonprofit guru and and a mentor and somebody to this day that I'm blessed to have connected with at the beginning. So um, that, and do you have any questions on the screen before I move on? I think you spoke a little bit about uh, your notable accomplishments. Can you um, repeat who the person, who the nonprofit mentor slash guru is again? Um, you know, I would say that there's, well, I, I, right away, I said, I said there's one and then there's two other ones that come to my <laughs> mind. Um, uh, I've been blessed by a few. This is Dr. Kitty Bickford is oh. her name. And um, I, I would have to do a Google on her website. But if you Google Dr. Kitty Bickford 501c3 exempt, and she's got a website, and she's actually written books and um, has information on she'll be able to set up 
nonprofits in every state and um, is extremely, extremely knowledgeable. Um, and I believe actually is in fact getting her master's in grant writing right now. So she, she does not let grass grow under her feet is one of the phrases my dad says and I, I love it. So I, she's one of them. Another one is Kirsten Stevens, which um, I'm not sure if I connected you with, but she has a, um, I'm now I'm not sure which everything, whether it's a 501c3 or 501c or, or a B corporation, but she has the capacity for good and um, the community forum for nonprofits on Facebook. Um, but Kirsten Stevens is out of, um, and, and if I haven't connected you with her, she is somebody that I was, I was connected with in the beginning of my time in Florida. And, um, and then the other thing, the other one that immediately came to my mind is my small business development mentor in, um, in Florida that again, I was connected with. Um, so the SBDC, uh, which is generally funded now, they, the, the a challenge, if you will, is sometimes they don't take nonprofits under a certain size and nonprofits will often um, end up, not end up, but they, it's, and SCORE is amazing. Um, but I believe as well, not only is SCORE amazing, but SVDC, I was very blessed um, to get George Gadsden, who is an SBDC mentor in the nonprofit sector at a very early stage in, in, in leaving and getting established and getting to Florida. So in, about in 2017, 2018. So, um, and it, that was through just going to a boot camp at a children's services in the area. So I was connected to him because of that. So it's all those things that I never would have gotten connected to that resource if it wouldn't have been for other steps to get there. Um, and not to say that score is not amazing. And I've been to some amazing sessions and had, and I know there's amazing SCORE mentors, but um, this George Gadsden with SBDC has since connected me with other SBDC mentors, and it was as a result of that that we were recommended to the FAU Tech Runway competition, and they, you know, so there's different, and, and again, then resources on that um, state level that we wouldn't have, again, those immediate connections built at this stage if it wasn't for different steps falling in the way that they did. Yeah, absolutely. And you name dropped quite a lot there. That's amazing. It just shows that this any building any type of organization relies on connections and connections of connections of connections. You don't know where the chain is going to end. And that's the best part out of all of this. So yeah, really cool, Sarah. Go ahead. We'd love to learn more about your organization. So, you know, so then in looking at where, where can we make the difference? Where is that gap? Uh, we definitely came into making the difference through computer science education. And so with FAU, part of the first six weeks we spend, and this is the FAU Tech Runway, and we could only apply because we were providing a technology solution. And so it, they really wanted us to identify our customer and identify it more than being K through 12. And I have since gone back to saying K through 12. But um, anyways, so we really identified and it was again looking back at the value can or the business model canvas which we worked through with the Jim Moran organization and the Jim Moran organization provides amazing again any nonprofits in Southeast Florida check into the Jim Moran nonprofit organization their teachers one is an English major and does awesome in English and she's okay in computer science but the other one has a computer science major teacher that has that experience and background and that's one of the things that um so you can imagine so just take that picture of um twin girls that are in the same school they have teachers that have different um different interests and and have different interests in the amount of of integration that they'll take into a, integrating computer science into their curriculum and let's say they have three different curriculums to choose from 
um, and then they can adapt it to however they want to adopt it. So you can see that that's uh, tough to attain in even one school, much less in different districts that are funded different, differently, different states, everything. So um, we learned a lot through that. And, um, you know, we actually want to go on to the National Science Foundation uh, national level. And uh, that's another whole big initiative and we'll see how that goes um but you know you don't have to see the whole staircase just take the first step and you know again i i've learned that through this so uh which way do you go how do you get to where you want to be um where do you where do you want to be and that's important in fact even with the nonprofit i'm learning where do i want to be because as a nonprofit leader i know that ultimately the nonprofit doesn't belong to me i can't get paid as a nonprofit um leader that's both on the board and and working as an executive director founder main person if you will I'll Ultimately, there's a conflict of interest, so you have to pull yourself out of that, and there's a transition that happens with it. Um, so you need to figure out what role you want to play, um, but you get to figure it out, and that's a fun part. I, I say, you know, to, in, to anyone who is like, hey, I want to I wanna do what you're doing, or, you know, I want to join you, and I'm like, well, what role do you want to play? You know, and, and that's what I was blessed with, with that mentor that asked, uh, the world, if the world was your oyster, what would you do? Uh, he was asking me that and and it was kind of like I was able to close my eyes and you know in my early 20s you know go I would make a difference in the lives of kids and he's like well what do you think that would look like and I'm like well, it'd probably be a nonprofit, and we sketched it out right there now you think it went into that no it took it was probably 10 years after that before I finally got that 501c3 <laughs> but so we festered and built for a long time with a lot of notes so you can see I go right into the next thing you know you think you're gonna have an idea you're gonna network a little and there's gonna be success but it is so not like that is a series of all these decisions and branches and and, you know, as you can tell, you know, you're going to work like crazy. Um, it's, it's so not an overnight success that when, you know, that just happens. And I'm, I have a team of FAU entrepreneurs, part of a class right now as the FAU, part of this FAU Tech Runway. And there's three, four for entrepreneurs in the class. And I can already see that, you know, they're like, you know, wanting a, I had put any I had put 12 tasks in order of priority that needed to be done within our organization and I could tell the one that chose the the easiest and already I can see based off of I'm like you know you're not jumping in you're not an entrepreneur has to wear so many hats and you know that's why it takes so much and I can right away see and this was a picture so excuse me but I'm seeing there is an s missing <laughs> there is my <laughs> and so that was an image dropped in so success success um, but willing to make mistakes even and willing to acknowledge and point them out and um, you know take the direction so I'll go into some of the next things which is I just want to you know kind of talk about a few key pieces of advice that I really would pass along to any entrepreneur um, one is you know find your passion and find your purpose so find that and find your passion, find your purpose. It does go hand in hand, I believe. Uh, so I tried various things along the way. I traveled. I I love wood burning. So I think it's important to have an outlet. When I was in Kenya, uh, in fact, all of the children, part of the children's home, which is Molly Children's Family. And if you look look up mollymovie.com um, there is a movie about this organization which is um, one of the largest children's homes in the world I believe certainly in Kenya and um, they uh, rescue children off the streets of um, and out of Kibera slums which is one of the largest slums in the world and that's in Nairobi and uh, the children each become part of the family and even though they're a children's home at 18 they're not just put out on the street if you will um, or given a certain amount 
amount of money like we often do in our West, Western system. Um, the children have an opportunity to give back and continue to volunteer and work towards their goals in their life. And in fact, this organization, because they don't have enough funds at this point to send all of their children to university, they're building a university. So um, there's a can-do attitude. <laughs> and I just love what they're doing. So check out mullymovie. Um, I believe it's mullymovie.com. Uh, we can certainly do that as a follow-up if necessary. But um, that was my first trip over in 2011. And then in the bottom right-hand corner is 2016 when I was a teacher. Uh, some just fun things that I've done along the way and experience that's going to happen. So you're going to find things you like and be good at it and your um, things that are, are a hobby as we're doing this rocket program right now, uh, which is leading into the next thing. We're doing a four week rocket program in Fort Lauderdale area with three collaborative community partners. And this is funding. We got our first fully funded grant um, of uh, of, I'll be honest, $10,000, and that was in uh, August of this year. And it's really hard to, as a young nonprofit, to kind of break that. Um, break that barrier and start to get fully funded on different. And there's a few different reasons behind it, um, but it. They say it takes three to five years to really start gaining traction and I get I thought I could do it in six months and I'll tell you it's now been almost two and a half years. Uh, but it's in order to win that FAU competition, we had to do I had to do a I had to I had to do a business plan and it was a detailed business plan. I had to answer answer questions about the top three risks and uh, what we were doing to and, and in fact I reached out to nonprofit leaders in the in in the Facebook groups and asked for help and got some real, real good help on crafting the right answers. And so, you know, you have to be, be patient and be persistent because at FAU, uh, 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 even though we didn't win the seed money, having all the mentors and having now now the so the mentors were saying to me sure you want to be, be global sure you want to do this but you know they're helping point in the right direction and they're help their business leaders um that are really helping us move to that next level and so when i say you know um stubbornness can be a good thing um you know my my husband had we have mango trees in the area that we live and he had said you know yeah I'll bet you you know you can't get a dozen and i said well watch me and he was out running the one day and all he hears is you know thump 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 and he looks and I'm 15 feet high in the tree like I grew up again on a dairy farm and out in trees so I'm up I'm a tree climber I climbed to the top of the tree and you can see that whole stash of mangoes that I ended up accumulating from a tree that was loaded with mangoes at the top that were just oh, amazing so it is really about your attitude and what you choose to do and I had so much fun doing it and at the same point you know when I say line up for the next shot it's take the education continue to take the education I'm already seeking my next education and where where is it going to take me so as an entrepreneur ask for the help and listen to it um, you know it's about a team it's I'm I'm learning the leadership in fact one of my one of my mentors had said, uh, or actually, I don't know whether it was a mentor, someone had said, you know, you're a true leader when you inspire others to be leaders. And it was interesting because it was the leadership class that I was like, I should take this. This is perfect. And I thought, no, this is perfect for this person. And it was somebody else on our team that, you know, it was, it just happened that way, but it was really cool. So, you know, go for your mentors and take the advice. Yeah, Sarah, um, yeah. I think so I want to give leave some time for questions with uh, yeah. the people who have joined this call. I know Shalini is here too. And she works in the international development and education space as well. So do you mind if you know, if we um, right, move right into Q&A now? No problem. Go ahead. Awesome. All right. So does anyone have any questions for um, for Sarah and her awesome work. And if not, I have a burning question to ask. All right, well, I'll just start with my question. 
Um, so I know Christopher is here working in Cambodia, and I know that you even started your work um, based out in Kenya. I started my social entrepreneurship journey based off of my experience in India. So there's this international development component and this international um, seed that ultimately started all of our journeys or our budding journeys in the social impact space. Can you tell us why that, why traveling internationally or ultimately having these experiences can be such an inspiration to give back to the communities around the world and maybe even in our own countries? Yeah. Well, I love that. And I love that question because, you know, and one of the things that I would encourage is to get involved with the United Nations and your global chapter. And that was one of the things that honestly happened a little bit by fluke um, for us. And I say by fluke, but again, um, Kitty Bickford had written it into our, um, a lot, we align it with our core values. And that was one of the accomplishments as we were recognized by the United Nations Broward as our alignment to the global social development goals, which is the global SDGs. And that's really huge. And I think it's really the United Nations as an organization and, and because of the, the 17 SDGs, there is not one of them that we don't, we can't find mutual alignment together through that organization. So one, it gives, um, it gives an avenue for uh, social impact leaders to make a difference globally and make an impact and be recognized globally and get involved and and I think there's that network already there through that and I certainly have found that in a very very short time through United Nations Broward chapter and um, so why I think that's where one of the things is where do you find the synergy we uh, there's a partner that once said you know wants to be a strategic partner out of Uganda and says you know have you ever been to Uganda and I I'm thinking in my mind uh, I wouldn't go to Uganda if, and it's again, just not, it's just because right now I'm so busy and I, I can do other things better than me going to Uganda. Now I have a partner, I have somebody that I'm a partner, I have somebody that I know that often, I believe he loves it, lives in Uganda, or I have certainly, there's contacts that I've made across the U.S. and across the world um, based on, again, we look at stepping stones. So, um, you know, it's uh, the partners and the people that I've made contact with throughout the world, I would initially go to them and ask for their help rather than me traveling to Uganda. Does that mean that I'm not going to make that partnership? I'll still make that partnership, but it will be through a different kind of vetting process than me just going there. So, and I believe that mutual alignment can come through the UN SDGs to start, the globe, UN global SDGs to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have a question from Christopher. Any advice on gaining support <laughs> for your cause for someone starting an organization? How do I find people who share the same passions? It's interesting because one of my, there was a mentor and in seeking mentorship and in seeking, uh, seeking guidance, I had reached out to this one mentor that we met and we've only met once and he gave me a few key pieces of advice and I know I can reach out to him again, by the way, whenever I need to, but I am always very cognizant of um, mentors and that often when you meet, you get a ton of stuff to do. And um, often then we'll continue to meet with them rather than just taking the time and doing what they've suggested we do. So my mentor, George Gadsden, he'll tell you for the first year or two, we met, I think two or three times a year because I did not have a proper update for him based off of what he asked me to do from the previous time. So unless I had that and unless I had a plan going in of what I needed his help and expertise for, but he'll tell you now he's part of the FAU mentor team still since 2017 when he started mentoring me, he's still now part of that FAU mentor team and will say that I've, I've followed those steps of the journey. So how do you find people with the same passion going to the mentors? He One of the things he said to me as he says one, he says the one of the hardest things that you will ever do is find people that have the same passion and heart to do what you do. Um, so that is one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do. He says, second, don't ever, ever sacrifice your partner, spouse, or family in order to make that happen. So my husband reminds me of that one. Um, and uh, so put your boundaries. If you work from home, have your office set your boundaries because again, you know, don't burn yourself out. Look at the big picture. You're trying to do good, but you have to take care of 
yourself. You have to, I mean, I had burnout in the corporate world and I know it can happen in the, in the nonprofit world. And there is different challenges in whether it's for profit, nonprofit, anything we individually have to take care of ourselves. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, how can we serve and give of our heart to others, you know? So even if something happens in the day, I take a five step, five minutes away and to say, I need a walk or I need a bike ride, you know? So um, make sure that you're in that spot to be able to fill your mission and be that shining light. So somebody had signed their signature a while ago, focus and shine. And I love that. So I changed that to my signature and I'm not claiming it. Anyone else is welcome to use it, but focus and shine. And it really, it's something that, you know, I really love. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. And I love that advice about the importance of mental health and starting your own organization. I wanted to plug Impaction for Christopher really quick. Um, Christopher, I know this is the first time that I'm meeting you, but we um, have an organization that is a community of people who have started nonprofits and for-profit companies specifically for social good. So I would urge you to um, sign up for our newsletters sign up in our Facebook group as well, because we have so many, like we have thousands of people um, that could be helping you. And if you wanted to host a video session of your own, just to share your idea and what you're thinking of starting in your organization, we have consultants, we have people who can come on the call and solve the challenge for you. Um, and I think Shalini, she said, networking the best way you can, um, like, ultimately will help you. Um, joining small nonprofit groups, look at the organization that's similar to yours and look at who supports them. Slowly you'll be linked to others. So it is, it is a causal chain and it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience, but you should set a fraction of your time specifically just to networking, whether you're a for-profit or nonprofit company. Um, but yes, it's there. Everything is virtual now, even if you're working internationally. So there's a good and a bad side of it, um, or not bad side, but a more difficult side of doing things that way. Um, but it's definitely possible. Great question. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, you know, the other thing is it just comes to mind. And when I say volunteer at local organizations, it's if you already have that, then um, do it as collaborative efforts with like minded organizations, you know, because you're going to the one thing I learned early in my business career, and it was actually uh, someone who who was would have been a competitor to me in a space and she had been a salesperson in this in the big territory i was moving to for six months prior and uh, just to just to give an example she gave me her excel spreadsheet database of 600 contact names and email addresses and said to me you know, it wasn't like, you know, I'm giving you my company's information that they built. She says, I've built this spreadsheet myself in the six months since I've started. She says, you can get the same information, but she goes, I'm just, she goes, we, we work in the same space. So she goes, the parties, the sandbox is big enough for all of us. So I think that going in with a collaborative approach from the beginning, I learned that, you know, my husband had said, well, why are you giving this idea to somebody? Because we were talking about collaboration and I hadn't had them sign an MOU first and, or I'm sorry, the, um, the non-disclose. I hadn't had them ha sign a non-disclose and, and he goes, why are you saying this? And I said, you know what? I said, if they take it, then the party, the sandbox is big enough for all of us. I said, God bless them if they can achieve it faster than me and maybe we collaborate together in different kinds of ways. So um, I think collaboration is key uh, and, and I'm continuing to pursue that. So, you know, look at the three, you know, that we're starting with the, we started pilot programs. So again, how do you, how do you get started when you're small? Like, I mean, you know, we started three small pilot programs. It doesn't matter if it includes 10 to 12 kids, you have to start somewhere. So start really small. You identify which ones I had identified, which community partners I wanted. Now I didn't get the ones that we wanted right away. So I was like, why is this one not calling me back? Why is this one not calling me back? Like these ones are perfect 
perfect. And they just, I wasn't getting the contact back. And so I went to somebody that I trusted in the community at Children's Services at Broward. And I said to that person, who would you recommend that I contact in terms of community partners for this program? And I was given a couple specifically com specific community partner names. And I was at, rather than saying, this one's not calling me back, this one's not calling me back. Hey, you know what? This COVID thing has hit all of us in different ways and every organization in different ways. And I could sit there and kind of feel like, uh, you know, well, we'll see how long it is till I work with that one, you know, but I can't, I can't hold any grudges. And, you know, it's not for any of us. You know, we are all doing the best we can. I think it's important to stay laser focused on our mission. And, you know, one of the things, again, I've learned in my education is, is mission drift, staying focused on your mission and, um, and know that, you know, if it takes collaboration to achieve it a lot of funders are starting to look for more collaborative efforts I mean if if we can pull up all kinds of reports and I'm I love pulling up five different reports in the nonprofit world so uh, I have some good ones if anyone's interested in seeing them but just in terms of understanding both where is the money going is it what I didn't know actually in terms of the United Nations is of the top three United Nation SDGs education is not one of the top three that are funded and I didn't know that quality education is not one of the top three so anyways it's just uh, it's not just looking at funding but on a business level it kind of it's looking at where is the funding coming from you know and so yes so I'm trying that's part of building a sustainable business is not just relying on grants and donations but looking at is it fee for service is there different avenues that we can set up is there collaborative agreements and how can we all work together um, because often that's one thing whether it's in the business world the nonprofit world the education sector is there's not enough collaboration and I think it has to start in the community we all know that so um, you know the more community and collaborative efforts that can come together to make something happen that's the best way we can move forward, I think. I love that you said that, Sarah, because um, you had a good amount of nuggets in what you just said, the importance of seeing where the funding is going to and where it's coming from in any organization. Transparency is key. Number two, um, you were talking about uh, the importance of collaboration over competition, especially in the nonprofit space. Um, it feels like a lot of times resources are limited and because people start their own organizations, there's an oversaturation of nonprofits in the market itself. Um, and because of that, there is less collaboration and there is more competition. So I love what you said to your husband, um, just about it being, it's not about, you know, taking ownership of your idea. It's also about execution and following through with it. And, um, if you're laser focused on your mission and your values in one way and you have laid the foundation there then i think it's just about okay who can help the end user or the community member as much as um like in the most comprehensive way and it's about removing yourself from the eye and making it more of a we component to the work and social impact and that's what i think is missing especially when you have the business and the nonprofit lens, it's always about me and me getting the funding so um, you know, I can meet these metrics. I can look the best for our stakeholders rather than are we really helping the community at the end of the day? Are we really providing direct and transparent impact at the end of the day? It's about really evaluating, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? And you know, how are people gonna actually benefit from this? not making assumptions, but really asking the community that. So I love that you said that, yeah. Sarah. That was a great well, advice. And and I'll tell you, it was one other thing that was really interesting to me because I'm always trying to seek places to, if you will, find funding whether where other nonprofits are not. And also, um, looking within the community and somebody had said to me and some nonprofit group she goes have you ever attended your council meeting um this this and this council meeting and i was like no not really she goes well the recycling department of mine had fifty thousand dollars to spend before the end of the year she said so we just said we can come up with an education program for kids that it's fifty thousand dollars worth and she goes 
<laughs> you know, it was, she goes, it was that easy. It was solving something that was a community need that there was funding and they were able to solve it. And because they were already set up in, in the system and they were already set up as a provider um, for that, for that county, it was a board meeting and it had to be spent and there wasn't much time. So they were awarded it. It was voted on and they were awarded it. It wasn't like, you know, it was just so look in, look in places that other, other organizations won't. And that's often in your community. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I do want to respect everyone's time. I know we are at time now, um, but I'm going to connect everyone via email um, after this session. If y'all want to, uh, connect offline. We um, really, you know, hope that you guys have um, some sort of overlap. I think Christopher, you in particular, um, may have to speak to Sarah a little bit offline. She can offer a lot of support for you, and I'm happy to jump on a call with you as well. Um, but for now, uh, I think that we have to wrap up. I have a couple of announcements on our end, and um, you know, before I get to that, I want to thank Sarah for your amazing work, for your energy, for your spirit in this space. It's not easy to do this work. Success is not linear. And you're making connections. You're doing community development work um, in incremental ways. So thank you for sharing your work and your mission with the world. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate it. And thank you to you and to everyone else. Uh, one of my, again, dear mentor and friend, he says to me, he often says, if this was easy, everybody would do it. And, um, and it's true. So, you know, it's often not easy, but it is very, very fulfilling. And I can say even, you know, to, uh, yeah, very fulfilling, as you know. So thank you for having me and thank you for, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help and connect with anyone from here and or that listens to this afterwards. So. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you um, for having me. All right, so Thank I you. have announcements for you before we um, before we split for today. So our social impact job portal is up and running on our website. Feel free to post any jobs or apply to jobs in the social impact space through our website, www.myimpaction.com. Second thing is we're hosting a social innovation competition and applications open in two weeks. Um, so this is if you have an early stage idea of your project or idea in social impact, um, please do apply for the competition. You'll receive some funding and mentorship and networking opportunities, which Shalini spoke very highly about. So did Sarah. So yes, please participate in that. So what we're um, last thing that we have is called the International Community Project. And this year we're going to be hosting an international book drive where people around the world donate books to their local schools, nonprofits, or even um, thrift stores. So we ask people around the world to donate over the course of a month and just complete a survey um, telling us where they donated and how many books and what kind of books they donated to. Last year, we did a clothing drive and we donated over 1,500 items of clothing over a month and we were able to share that through the seemingly simple act, we were able to um, save over 1 million gallons of water, reduce carbon emissions by 19,000 pounds. So it's our annual month of giving in November. So get ready for that. Get ready to collect your books and donate. And um, we will be in touch about that in the next two weeks or so, but really excited about that too. Um, so I will, you know, respect everyone's time. Sorry, we're a little over time today, but thank you so much for joining again. And thank you, Sarah, for your heart and your mission to help the world. Thank you guys.